and that is, you know, what it takes to truly be a Drift King. Now, some of you might not know this, but the only reason I got into drifting or any kind of racing in general is because of my older brother, Bill, who sadly passed away in 2015. And a lot of people keep asking me, you know, like, well, how did he introduce you into racing? Well, he introduced me into street racing back when the first Fast and Furious came out. That's when I first learned about street racing. And that's when I was like, you know, how can I get into this? And, you know, that's when I got my hands shortly after on Need for Speed Underground 2. And there was this type of racing on Need for Speed Underground 2 at the time that I had no idea existed called drifting. And at first I did it for fun, you know. I didn't know what it was about. I didn't understand it. All I knew is that, you know, getting my car sideways and sliding was just hella fun. Like, I really enjoyed it. It was something I was, you know, fun with doing. It something I really got into. And then later on... When Tokyo Drift came out, that's when I learned, you know, that it's an actual sport. Because at the time, I didn't know it was a sport. I had no idea. And a lot of people sit there and say, oh, well, you know, oh, drifting's not a sport. You know, you're just throwing your car sideways and sliding. Well, yeah, we are throwing our cars sideways and sliding. But there's a lot of technical challenges believe it or not it's one of the most skilled challenging and one of the most technically challenging sports that you can ever do because when you're throwing your car sideways at a hundred miles an hour you got to be able to keep control of that car and be able to pull that e-brake and still control your car as you have no traction keep in mind the entire time you're going sideways you have no traction And a lot of people think that, oh, just because, you know, you do it in-game or, like, you drift in a video game, that doesn't make it real. Believe it or not, gaming is a sport as well as drifting. There's a lot of different styles of gaming out there. And the one that I'm best with that I excel at is drifting. And when I learned it was a sport and I learned that there were actual competitions, I didn't worry about the competitions. I just did it for the fun of it. And at the age of 16, I became the youngest Drift King to beat the world record for Hillside Manor on Need for Speed Underground 2. And the only reason I, that that happened for me is because a friend of mine was actually filming me when he was over at my house hanging out. And I didn't know he was filming me at the time until he uploaded my video to YouTube. Because I was drifting down Hillside Manor just for the hell of it. And just having fun. And like I said, I don't know where the video is at or if it's still up. But if I can find it, I will post it up. But because of my friend who I went to school with, you know, I became the first Drift King for, you know, Underground 2. And ever since, you know, I started getting into it a lot. And a lot of people think that... You know, just because, you know, like, I hold the title as the youngest Drift King from the age of 16 for my generation, you know, that I'm too old to be doing it because I'm 27 and this and that and da 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 Well, let me tell you something. I mean, because a lot of people tell me that, you know, I'm washed up, that, you know, I need to give up you know, drifting in game and start doing it in real life. And they think that just because, you know, I do it in game, I'm not a real DK, but that's not true. Let me tell you something right now to every single one of you who doesn't think that it's for real or think that being a DK is bullshit. Let me tell you something. Being a true drift king isn't just about, you know, setting world records or holding titles. It's about accepting your losses and learning from those losses. 
It's about taking the wins with the defeats and the losses. It's about never giving up. It's about constantly, you know, pushing yourself and applying what you learn to what you do. Because let me tell you something. Back when I first started out and I learned it was a sport and I started studying it, I started watching documentaries like Drift Bible. I started watching drifting documentaries. I started watching the anime series Initial D, which is revolved around street racing and the drift scene. And ultimately, I started watching, you know, Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift on a constant basis every chance I got to study how they did it. I studied not only, not only is it a great movie all around, but I studied the styles, the different styles of drifting that each character has in the movie. And I tried to copy it. I tried to take their style and make it my own in my own way. And people don't realize that even when you're gaming, when you're doing drifting and gaming, there's a lot of realistic stuff that goes into it. Like, you got to know how to yank that e-brake. You, you got to know how to keep your car, you know, sideways and not lose control because... Believe it or not, it's a lot harder than people realize. I didn't become, you know, a drift king overnight. I had to practice over and over, day and night, every single day. And even to this very day, I was 27 now. Even to this day, I still take my stuff back to the basics. I work my basics. I train my ass off every day and every night. That's how I got good. And let me tell you something. Four years ago, I decided to pick it back up and, you know, start up my YouTube channel and, you know, really get into it full on to see where it could take me. Well, when I uploaded a video of me doing a downhill run, a downhill drift run on Hillside Manor, on Need for Speed Underground 2 and I uploaded it to my YouTube channel you know I didn't think anything of it and you know I just kind of left it there and let it sit there but you know about four years ago I went on the Facebook you know looking for you know a group that I can join you know for drifting for people like myself who were really getting into it and that's when I came across this group called Need for Speed Drift Kings. And, you know, I joined it and, you know, whatnot. And met some really cool people in there. But, little did I know that that group had two people that not only would become two of my best friends on the planet, but literally become like my brothers. Literally my brothers. And those two are Ethan and Mel. And Starboy Ricardo. Those two not only became my best friends over these last five years, but ultimately, you know, my brothers. Like, they've been there for me through everything, you know, both in drifting, outside of drifting. You know, they've really been there for me and very, very supportive. And let me tell you something not only have they been supportive, but they've pushed me. To be the best that I can be. Like if I did something wrong in drifting. They said no. Do it again. Redo it. Do it until you get it right. Even if you screw up just a little bit. You know start over. Redo it. And it's them being hard on me. Like they were. That really showed me you know where. I needed to train. Where I needed to work on things. And everything like that. And what people don't realize is that gaming is an actual sport. Like if you look it up. You have the National Gaming League. You have the National Gaming Association. You have a lot of different companies that are professional gaming. And yeah, you have different styles of gaming. You know, you have fighting. You have RPG. Um, you have first person shooter games, which I'm also big on. Huge fan of Call of Duty. And you know, like other games like Mortal Kombat, very huge on those. But my number one 
style of gaming is always and forever going to be racing, whether it's NASCAR, whether it's circuit, sprint, drift, somewhat drag. Like, I'm okay with drag racing, but I'm not, like, that good, but I don't get in there with that. But my main style is and forever will be, you know, drift racing. And for those of you that, you know, still don't think that drifting in game is just as real as it would be in real life and on a track, I challenge you right now to go out, buy a GameCube or a Nintendo Wii, or if you can get it for PC, get it for PC and download Need for Speed Underground 2 or buy Need for Speed Underground 2. Beat the entire game, customize your ride how you want, and tweak the settings in the dyno. Because the settings on that, the settings on Pro Street are very realistic. So they're not, those two games out of the Need for Speed series are not just games. They are simulators. Because they allow you to tweak every single little inch of your car. Whether it be, you know, your rear sway bar. Oh, excuse me. Like, everything from your rear sway bar to your shocks, your springs, you know, your gears. It allows you to tune and tweak every little aspect of your car. And each person is different. Each driver is different from the next. We all have our own style of drifting. Because one thing I did learn from Ethan and Ricardo is we all have our own style of drifting. And how you drift your car, how you drive your car, shows who you are. And believe it or not, that's actually a good thing, sir. Because believe it or not, drifting in a circle is... You're actually already good as is. Because believe it or not, drifting and doing donuts in a circle is actually a form of drifting. Because believe it or not, that's how a lot of people start out. They start out by doing donuts. And at first, when I first started out, that's how I started out. Like, I started doing donuts... Because I couldn't keep my car straight. And you know, once I practiced and I got good enough at it, I was able to take that car, drive it, and do what I do best. But a lot of people think that, oh, you got all these titles, big whoop, and you know, like, you know, you're still not for real. Just because you do it in real, don't do it in real life, you know, it's not real. Well, that's where you're wrong. Like I said, being a Drift King, whether it's in-game or in real, is all the same. Because in-game, when you're drifting on games like the one I have up now, which is Need for Speed Underground 2. When you're drifting that car, you got to be able to apply everything that you learn from watching real-life documentaries and how-to videos. And applying that to your stuff in game. You gotta be able to take what you learn from these videos and from real life and apply those skills to your in game skills. So yes, there is a level of technical difficulty. There is a level of, you know, challenge there. That's like with me, I'll admit, I'm not the world's best. And even if I do someday down the road become the world's best, I still will not see myself as the best. Even now, being at the age that I am, I still don't see myself as one of the best. Because I know there's somebody out there better than I am. And the one thing that I have seen going around that I do not like And it's something that, you know, you can get your hands on real easily, which is for PC only, thank God, which are these things called drift trainers for games like Need for Speed Underground 2. 
And what they do is they allow you to drift, you know, without wrecking. They allow you to get high scores like that. But let me tell you something. Those things, for those of you that use those, you may as well quit right now because you do not truly own the title of a Drift King when you use a trainer. The way you earn the title of a Drift King like I have earned is by practicing every single day and every night and working your ass off like I've had to do. And most people ask me, you know, well, why do you do it? Well, one, well, the basic answer for any driver is, you know, why not? Because it's fun. But I have a lot of reasons why I do it. One of them being because, you know, like I said, my older brother who passed away in 2015, he's the one that got me into it. If it wasn't for my older brother getting me into, you know, the racing scene in general, I don't know what I'd be doing right now, to be honest with you. And to be honest with you, outside of my immediate family, you know, there's three things that are very important to me. Obviously, you know, the love of my life, Abby. But other than that, you know, like besides her, you know, the other two things that mean the world to me are drifting and my friends and family. Yes, I have my immediate family, but I also have, you know, you guys, along with the love of my life and drifting. Like those are the, granted, yes, my music is important to me, but not as important, as important. Because, you know, I can always pick up music at any given time. That's always gonna be there. But, you know, for me, drifting isn't just about holding a title. It's a way of life. When I found the drifting community, that's when I found my home. Granted, like, you guys know what I mean. Like, not like this, like, the place I live. But, like, I found where I belong. And that is with the drifting community. When I found the drifting community, that's where I found, you know, where I belong. This is something, you know, I've been very passionate about for a lot of years. You know, I can write a song right now and just be done. But after I write that song, and this is something that a lot of you don't know. Like, as soon as I'm done, you know, with, you know, doing what I do with my music during the day, you want to know what I do the first moment I wake up? I wake up, I grab a cup of coffee, I turn on TV to see what's on, and then right after that, I freaking flip on my Wii, and I start practicing. Every day and every night, as much as I can, I practice. Even when I'm writing a song or like I'm working on a song, I'm practicing my drifting all at the same time. Whether I'm listening to a beat, whether I'm listening to a song to get ideas, whether I'm listening to an instrumental that I put out or that I did, you know, I'm always, you know, doing that as I'm listening to it. And a lot of people don't think that drifting is a real sport. Look up people like Ken Block. Look up the Drift King, Kichi Tsuchiya. He is the godfather of drifting. He is the man that invented drifting. And watching his documentary, Drift Bible, you know, it really, you know, helped me to see what different styles of drifting there are, like the different techniques. And every time I drift, when I first started out, I would practice each technique. You know, just every day until I got it right. Every day I would practice. And a lot of people seem to think, oh, it's not that hard. It's a lot harder than it looks. Believe me, take it from somebody that's been doing it for a very long time. Would I like to be able to do it in real life? Yeah, I would. But that takes some money that I don't have. Because I have a lot of people telling me, you know, dude, 
like the way you drive on Need for Speed Pro Street and Underground 2, you'd be really good at regular drift racing. And, you know, and that's one reason I love playing, you know, Pro Street so much is because when you hold the Wii Remote, you hold it like a steering wheel and you use it just like a steering wheel. Yeah, you have your gas, your brake, and your nitrous spray and everything else. But when you're driving your car, you're holding that Wii Remote as if it's an actual steering wheel. So there is a very, you know, big level of, you know, realisticness that went into, you know, that game, which I can honestly say I am very proud to say that they did really well with that. But, like, a lot of people think that, you know, drifting is not a sport when, in reality, whether you're in-game, whether you drift in-game or in real life, at the end of the day, drifting is drifting. A driver's a driver. And yes, I know that I'm quoting a quote from the first Fast and Furious movie, but one thing that is true with any sport with any racing sport, whether it's in-game or in real life. It doesn't matter whether you win by an inch or by a mile. Winning is winning. Just like with drifting, whether it's in-game or in real life. Drifting is drifting. We all have our own way of doing it. Because some of us can't afford a car. So we do the next best thing, which is to do it in-game. And believe me, I met a lot of very cool people, you know, within the drifting community. I've gotten the chance to, you know, talk to several people who do it, you know, in real life, who see what I do and are very impressed by it. I've gotten the chance to sit down and do, you know, drifting sessions on the game Art Factor with guys like one of my favorite YouTubers, you know, Slap Train, who's one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. Like, you know, like, he's just like I am. You know, drifting is what he loves to do. Just like it's what I love to do. That's like the first thing that I, believe it or not, I started drifting before I started doing music. I started doing drifting when I was 16. And that's when I first learned about it. When I was 16, that's when I first learned about it. So I've been doing drift racing far longer than I've been doing my music. My music, I started out when I was 19, 20, 21. So imagine that. Think about how much time and effort and hard work I put in from the time I was 16 up until now. And even now, I do still make rookie mistakes. We all make rookie mistakes. Do I see myself as the best? No. I don't. Because I know that there's somebody out there who's a hundred times better than I am. But the one thing that I do detest and just cannot stand are all these people that use trainers on PC that, you know, think, oh, I'm using a trainer. You know, like, I don't have to worry about it. You know, like, oh, I use a trainer. You know, I'll, you know, beat this record and be the best. Sorry, but if you use a trainer, you're not the best. To me, being the best is not about taking shortcuts like using a trainer. Being the best and being a true DK like myself takes hard work and practice. As a matter of fact, AJ Styles from WWE, from wrestling, said this actually tonight. You know, like, and... Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to quote him 100%, but 
he did say that to earn your spot, there are no shortcuts. You have to be willing to, you know, take your losses with your wins. There are no shortcuts to being truly great. If you take a shortcut, you're automatically a loser. If you take a shortcut, you're selling yourself short. You get your opportunities cut real short that way. Now let me tell you something. Not once have I ever taken any shortcuts in what I do. I've always worked my ass off in everything I do. And that's what makes a true champion in any sport, no matter whether it's trading cards like Yu-Gi-Oh! No matter whether it's in racing games like what I do with drifting, no matter what sport you're in, if you cut corners, you're going to get your opportunities cut very short. The same with me in the music industry, you know? Yes, every day I face scrutiny. I even posted up what the A&R representative from, you know, WB Records. And you guys don't know WB Records, Warner Brothers Entertainment, Warner Brothers Records. You know, they've done a lot of, a lot of major movies and stuff. I even posted up, you know, what their A&R had said to me in an email last night. But, you know, even in music, I have never once taken any shortcuts. I have always worked my ass off day and night. So, point being, no matter what you do, don't be taking any shortcuts because it's not going to get you anywhere except hurt in the end. And it's going to get your opportunities cut very, very short, really quickly. Now, let me tell you something right now. And I know this is kind of off topic, but this does pertain to what I just said with record labels. Do you really think that is fair? And that you record labels out there who I know are probably watching this right now? Do you really think it's fair what you guys are doing? Just because I don't have any money, do you really think that's very fair? What you guys are doing to me every day, scrutinizing me, putting me down, you know, making me to where I literally today actually broke down into tears because of what one of your A&R representatives had said to me. And if you guys don't know what the A&R representative said to me, he basically told me that I had no chance at making it in the music industry because of how I look and because of the fact that I don't follow these trends like a lot of these mainstream artists do. Like, I don't follow that crowd. I stand out. I'm different. I do me. I don't sell out like a lot of these others do. That's not me. That's not who I am. And granted, yes, the way they worded it was very upsetting to me. I mean, do I think it's fair that I'm not signed to a label? No, I don't. But the one thing I do, I would like to do, is to start up my own record label. But the only way I can do that is to sell more of my stuff. And the only way I can sell more of my stuff is if you guys are willing to ask for the links to my shops, to both my shops that I have up, and to buy my merchandise. That's the only way I'll ever be able to make it. That's the only way I'll ever be able to become an independent record label owner.
or at least to be able to make it on my own as an artist. Because what you guys don't realize is a lot of you are saying, you know, like, go independent. You know, do your own thing. Go independent. Well, I want to. But it takes money to be able to be successful as an independent artist. It takes money to be able to start up my own record label. So I can't do that unless you guys help me out by buying, you know, either stuff from my RayJohn.com clothing line or my Dizzy Jam music store. That's the only way I can get any kind of money. Because what you guys don't realize is I can't work because I have to stay here at home to help my moms. So while our roommate is at work every day, I'm here at home helping my mom out. And I don't think you guys realize you know, what I get put through every day by these record labels. What I told you guys and what I posted on Facebook today about those labels is just the tip of the iceberg and just a glimpse at what I face every day. I get far worse from these labels. Mm. Sorry guys, did you know this? Mm. But, you know, that's just a taste, just a glimpse of what I face every single day from record labels and companies who I look into for signing me. And do I want to be able to prove these people wrong? Of course I do. But the only way I can prove them wrong is with your guys' help. Now, if you guys truly, truly, and I mean, if you guys 110% truly want to see me prove these guys wrong, you guys can help me in a major, major, major way. And that is by going to either my rageon.com music site, and if you guys go to rageon.com, look up D-K-C-U-S-T-O-M-S. That's DK Customs at rayjohn.com. You guys can find all my merchandise there for good prices. Or if you guys are interested in buying, you know, some music-based merchandise, you guys can go to dizzyjam.com and look up Shadow Blade. I have my sub on there. That's Shadow B L A Y D E. Y'all already know the spelling. And you guys not only will be buying an item, but you guys will be getting my full album of Urban Warfare for free download. So honestly, you guys are getting a good deal on that. You guys are getting two things for the price of one. So you guys are not only getting a t-shirt, a hat, a hoodie, or a coffee cup, but you guys are also getting a free full album too. But while I am on the subject of music, um, I do want to take a moment to, you know, extend, you know, my most heartfelt, you know, apologies and just to say how sorry I am for those families that had, you know, lost, you know, loved ones in the Las Vegas massacre the other night. Um, I too, you know, unfortunately I lost somebody, like nobody like close to me, but I lost a brand new fan to my music. She was actually killed saving a couple of people's lives. And I just found out through a friend of mine yesterday. And I didn't know that they were a fan until I got told. I had no idea that I had fans out in Vegas or in near the Nevada and California area. I had no idea. So to Angela Gomez's family, I want you guys to know that 
you know, your family, along with every other family that has suffered losses, I want you guys to know that you all have, you know, my most heartfelt apologies, as well as, you know, you guys are definitely in my thoughts and prayers, along with every other family who suffered a loss, and for those who lived. You know, you all have my prayers. You guys are in my thoughts and prayers every day. And to those that did survive and who did save lives, I want to say thank you to every single one of you. If it wasn't for you guys, a lot more lives would have been lost than what there were. So, you know, I do want to say, you know, thank you all to those who did survive that massacre and who helped save many, many lives that night and who made it home safe. So if you or anybody you know who was there that night and are watching this right now, I want to say thank you so much. Because everybody, you know, they, you know, a lot of people see me musically as a hero. But honestly, I'm not a hero. The true heroes are those that stood up and saved lives that night. People like my my new fan, Angela Gomez, who saved three girls' lives in her brother's life before she was killed. They're the true heroes. The, the true heroes are those that ran towards the gunfire and got on top of people to save them. They're the true heroes, not me. I'm no hero. If anything, I would have been running away from the gunfire. And for those that ran towards the gunfire, whether they were civilian, whether they, they were EMT, whether they were police officers, whether they were firefighters, they displayed true courage and bravery and true heroism. So what if I save a couple of lives through my music? The ones who are the true heroes are those that saved the lives of so many that night. They're the true heroes. Not me. I'm just a guy who, you know, takes his anger and frustration and depression and puts him out of his music as songs for people. That's all I do. I'm in no way, shape, or form a hero. Yeah, my song might save a life or two. And I'm glad about that, but at the end of the day, I still do not see myself as a hero. The true heroes are those of you that stood up that night and saved so many lives. So to every single one of you who saved, you know, those lives that night, I salute every single one of you. Because if it was not for you, more lives would have been lost. But with that being said, guys, um, if you guys do know anybody and that was there at night or have friends or family or have friends or family who knew somebody that was there or were there themselves, I want you to tell them that, you know, they are in my thoughts and prayers. And I want to say thank you to every single person. And to those that did have somebody who passed away in that massacre, I want you all to know that you guys and your families have my most, most, utmost, and deepest heartfelt apologies. No words can describe, you know, how sorry I am 
for you guys. There are no amount of words that can ever describe what I watched on the news. Because I didn't know about the massacre until the day after. That following morning. When I got home from my doctor's morning, I heard the glimpses about it on the radio, but I didn't know for sure. And I go to turn on the TV. And, you know, like the horror that I watched unfold was not only gut-wrenching and sickening, but it made me realize just how, you know, short your life can be cut just like that. Within seconds, your life can be taken away like that. This man took so many lives. And then he turned around and ended his own life. Like, you know, seeing that footage, you know, it made me realize just how short life can be. And, you know, watching that footage unfold, I was in tears. Watching that footage live on the news as bodies were being carried, as people were being shot and killed. Like, it was something straight out of a horror film. And to think this man committed the deadliest massacre in the history of the modern U.S. is unthinkable. It's unfathomable at how somebody can commit such a horrible, horrible act. And for those of you that, you know, do, you know, still live with your parents, I want you guys to go back, if you have not watched the footage yet, to go back and watch that footage. And every day when you get up, before you walk out that door, I want you to hug your family. I want you to hug and kiss your mom, your dad, or whoever, and tell them just how much you love them. Because you never know when you walk out that door if it's going to be your day to go or not. The minute you walk out the door, your life can be taken within an instant. The day you walk out that door could be your last. And that's why it's in, why family is very important. And so for those of you that you know, do know people that were out there that night or had somebody that knew someone out there that night, you know, I want you guys to tell them that, you know, they are in my thoughts and prayers. A hundred percent. As a matter of fact, I did a song cover earlier today of No One Gets Left Behind by Five Finger Death Punch or Five Finger Death Punch that I dedicated to those that lost their lives that night, to the heroes, to everyone with who was there that night. Along with another song that I did a cover of on Star Maker as well. I did two songs dedicated to the victims and the heroes that night. 
So if you are watching this and you do have family or friends out there that were killed or survived, I want you all to know that, you know, I appreciate every single one of you. And, you know, I want you guys to know that you are in my thoughts and prayers, you know, every second of every day. And I'm not just saying that, like, I truly and honest to God mean that. And if you guys also go to my Facebook, I do have the GoFundMe for Angela's family. So if you guys go down my timeline, it's there. If you guys can donate, you know, to her family, as well as to many others that had lost their lives that night. So with that being said, guys, I am going to hop off here. And if you want the links to Angela's GoFundMe or either one of my online stores, please message me or post in the comments that you want the links. And with that being said, guys, this is Chance, and I will see you guys later.